to the, the formation of the whole um, department. Um, we also have with us today, um, oh, I said, uh, Kelly Ward Mason, who's one of our program managers who, who set today up. We're also joined by Hi. Lee Murphy, our other program Hello, manager, brother. and Charlotte Hi, Namby, um, uh, other Who's person she? in our uh, office and who's done a lot of the work on setting today it, up. Joined by some of our other faculty, Tim Shaw and Jane Parpart, I see, are joining us. That's um, so brother. that's really yeah. exciting. Um, I don't look at that. What a crew. Okay, um, I am, um, it's gonna be a little bit confusing perhaps because I don't think we have the panel all sh sorted to show up at the top of your screen. Um, so you'll have to follow the bouncing ball around as we go. Um, but a couple of quick announcements as we get started um, and I'll make it a little bit easier by letting you see the announcements as well as hearing them from me. Um, so a couple of important upcoming dates. Uh, tomorrow afternoon, 3.30, we have our uh, department advising open house. So all of the graduate program directors will uh, be in Zoom rooms and we'll do group meetings for the students in each program, help you all get sorted out and, and registered for classes for the fall. Next up, May 6th, this is the third book celebration of the semester faculty has really been kicking stuff out. And so Karen Ross and some of her colleagues will be um, talking about their new research methods book, which is really exciting, new, new direction and talking about how to teach research methods. Um, we have a dissertation defense. Adriana Rincon Villegas will be um, doing her dissertation defense on May 7th. Um, and then later in May, the international relations master's students will be doing their capstone presentations on May 11th, and the conflict resolution uh, master students will be doing their capstone um, presentations on May 18th. So keep your eye out and please join us. I also want to point out to folks that we have got three uh, online course offerings this summer. Um, there is the, um, this is sort of we, because of uh, COVID, we've taken our summer study abroad programs and transmogrified them into online courses. So our Northern Ireland uh, peace building course um, uh, will be offered in um, from the end of May through mid June this summer. Um, we're offering a short two credit course on um, religious peace building with Darren Q also late May through late June. Um, and another short course, a one credit course um, this is a, uh, a translation of the, um, the summer program we usually do in Ecuador on, um, on uh, conflict transformation in border regions with Jeff Pugh and uh, his colleagues, um, Cecile Muli and Monica Hurst. Um, another one credit course, and that one runs in July. So there's a number of different options, one for three credits, one for two credits, one for one credit. Um, so number of different options there for summer course offerings. Um, I think that's about all I have by way of announcements. Um, what I wanted to do next is to take a moment. Many of you know that uh, one of our alumni from um, early in the years of the program, Ben Slomoff, who joined us when, and got his, his master's degree when he was in his 80s uh, and for uh, since 2000 has been um, funding the slow Muff lectureship that we hold each year, passed away this, this winter uh, at the age of 107. Uh, and Kelly's sharing a little slideshow. I'm gonna ask David Matz to say a few words about Ben. Sure. Um, I got to meet Ben when he was 83. Uh, he had just finished his undergraduate program uh, he's a man who never went to college because he went right from the army to work, uh, wound up being the owner of a very prosperous shoe factory, uh, sold that and was a fairly wealthy man and decided that his life needed education. So he went back to college at UMass, decided that conflict resolution was a great idea since he had spent, as he liked to say, most of his life causing conflict and he was deciding that it was time for him to figure out how to resolve it. Uh, we accepted him, of course, into the program. He was a very lively mind. 
um, a very lively guy. He was a poet. He had published two books by that point of poetry. He had published many more since. Uh, he had published some plays. He had plays put on in California that he had written. Uh, so th this was a guy who had plenty of energy, plenty of imagination, brought it to the program. But the story I want to tell was why it was really difficult for him to be in our program. Now, this had nothing to do with his inability to understand or be a student in the normal way. And I wish we hey. were. Hi. OK. Um, if we were all together in a room, I would be able to demonstrate better the problems that Ben encountered. So I'm going to try to do it uh, verbally. Um, first night of class. I was teaching negotiation. Ben was in the front row. And we started, and about a minute or so in, I asked the class a question. And Ben promptly answered without raising his hand. I wasn't quite sure what to do, but I proceeded. Asked another question a few minutes later. Uh, ben answered again without raising his hand. And the class was now clearly a little unbalanced. Weren't quite sure what to do with this. Some people had raised their hands. Ben was just speaking out. I decided that we would hold on this problem a little bit. Uh, I called an early coffee break, uh, took Ben aside and made a comment about the culture of universities and how these things are done. He was very apologetic. He said, I'm really sorry. Of course, you're right. This won't happen again. Thank you very much. So we go back in after the break. He sits down. And you'll have to imagine this since I can't demonstrate it. What I saw was Ben at one point put up his hand and started talking at the same time uh, before I had called on him. Uh, I let him talk and then he realized that he was speaking with his hand in the air. So he pulled his hand down, but then he stopped speaking because he, he had in his head that if he pulled his hand down, he wasn't allowed to speak. We went through this for about 10 minutes where he worked on the coordination of when he could speak and when he could raise his hand. Finally, of course, he mastered this little skill. And at the end of class, he stood up to the class and apologized and said, he introduced himself with the kind of humility that I was never quite sure how much was real and how much not. He said, I'm an old man and it's hard for me to learn these new ways, but I've been the president of a company for 40 years so whenever I wanted to speak, I just spoke. I didn't raise my hand. Everybody else raised their hand. So I'll adjust. Give me some time. Um, ben adjusted magnificently. He was a spectacular person to work with in many ways. And as Eben has suggested, he's been a very loyal alum uh, until his death uh, this year. Uh, he stayed in touch. Uh, he supported the program. And it was a wonderful man to work with. Thank you very much, David. Um, and I'll, we, we need to move on, but I will, I will share one very quick story, which was that um, after Christmas, the holiday break of my first year uh, teaching at UMass in 95, 96, um, I walked into uh, the office having grown a beard over the break. And the first thing David said when he saw me was, I didn't authorize that. So back at you, Matt. So I don't think you asked for my permission before you grew that one. Well, I thought retirement good. got me out of that problem, but okay. <laughs> I'll remember that the next time I grow up here. <laughs> okay, wonderful. So um, I am going to uh, invite our, um, our alumni guests. We have guests from the PhD program in Global Governance and Human Security, the Master's in International Relations, and the Master's in Conflict Resolution. Um, and I'm just going to ask you each to do uh, like a three minute, two, three minute introduction uh, about yourself and, and your work. Um, and I'm just going to call folks out in the order that you are popping up on my screen. Um, so, Abby, would you please introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Abigail Cavandula, and I'm a research scientist at the Af the Party Center for International Futures and the director of the Africa Center here at the Cobell School of International Studies in Denver. Um, what else did you say I, want, I needed to say? <laughs> Just a little bit about your work. Oh, about my work, yes. <laughs> so. Well, this week, Abigail, you had a big 
event with all sorts of eminent African men. Yes, um, last week and this week has been very busy. Thank you, Tim. Yeah. So um, at the at the party center, I work um, a lot with African governments, um, the UN, the US government, um, mostly on international development. So I work on, uh, if I was to put it more crudely, like policy stuff, like how um, helping policymakers to think, th think through policy issues and policy implementation. So I'll give you an example of one interesting project that I recently worked on was on the Africa continental free trade area. So this is a big uh, trade agreement that has been agreed on uh, with the African countries. And so the African Union asks a party center how the, the trade to, to assess the success of uh, its implementation. And so we worked with the African Union, um, different African governments to assess the uh, the trade effectiveness of the agreement, um, bilateral agreements that are already there. And so also advising them what would be the most likely cost for the um, trade area to, to work and to be implemented. So it will be finally implemented this year. They go beyond my time. That's great, that's great. Thank you, thank you. Um, continuing on with our, our PhD alum, Jeremiah. Oh, hi everyone. And thanks for the opportunity. It's, 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 I'm glad to be back home <laughs> and uh, to, uh, to connect to Abby. Abby, your last event, I attended your last event, it was really great. Yeah, it was, I was there for about an hour and then I left, but it was great, yeah. So I'm um, Jeremiah Saka, and uh, I'm an assistant professor of security studies at uh, Sam Houston State University. And at the department, uh, or my department, what I do is um, I was hired to bring the environmental dimension of security studies in. So that's what I mainly do. I'm trying to um, develop a environmental security portfolio at the department. And I'm also bringing in human security, as you know, that's part of my, my qualification. Yeah. Um, beyond that, I'm a dad to a little girl who's uh, giving me a lot of hard time at home because now we are all home. And um, yes, I think that's all I can, I can say for now. And maybe if you ask me more questions, I, I'll respond. Yeah. <laughs> great, great. Thank you. Thank you. Natalia. So hi, everyone. And thank you as well for the invitation. It's great to be back and, and to see so many familiar faces. My name is Natalia Escobar Pemberti and I am currently an associate professor at Universidad de Afir in Medellin, Colombia, even though I'm working remotely from Boston uh, since the pandemic started uh, because of, of family reasons. So uh, my work uh, there at the Afir is on the implementation of uh, different programs that have to do with experiential learning, with global governance, with international relations. And I also work at the moment on the design of a new graduate program on global challenges. Uh, and uh, I teach a class in international relations as well. And also uh, I work as part of the team that uh, Professor Maria Ivanova leads at the department uh, connecting and still working. Uh, I, it's gonna be four years that I defended my dissertation, three years since I graduated. So I continue working with Maria and all the team at the Center for Governance and Sustainability on the implementation of multilateral environmental agreements and all the stuff that has to do with global environmental governance. Wonderful, wonderful. So folks, those were our three amazing alumni from the Global Governance and Human Security PhD program. Uh, next, I'd like to uh, turn to the two alumni that we have with us from the Masters in International Relations. Uh, Andrew, would you please introduce yourself? Sure, uh, Evan, thanks for the, the introduction. Um, my name is Andrew Jackma, and I am actually a, a bit of an interloper here in this group. Um, while I am a graduate of the McCormick School, I, I did not um, 
specialize in, in international relations. This was, I was graduated prior to uh, that track being available. Um, however, I did graduate from UMass Boston with a BA in political science. Um, and as an undergraduate, um, I, I concentrated into in international relations. So, um, you know, I, I have sort of viewed this as just my undergraduate work was so compelling that uh, the McCormick School has conferred uh, an additional degree uh, to me, perhaps. But um, in spite of the fact that I am sort of not otherwise qu actually qualified to be part of this group, I, I'm really pleased to be here. Um, I'm professionally the chief of staff at the Center for Health Information and Analysis. Um, we are an independent state agency that is responsible for providing reliable and meaningful information to policymakers to help improve the performance of the Massachusetts healthcare system. Um, so, you know, what that means is um, we sort of maintain these multiple large databases and produce these analyses that sort of look at um, transactions in the healthcare system. Um, most notably, we are responsible for annually calculating um, the growth in total healthcare spending in the state of Massachusetts and comparing that growth to some benchmarks that are set each year um, for cost growth in the healthcare economy um, by the legislature. Um, Right. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, I'm a little disoriented by the change in video feed. Um, so I um, have been at uh, Chia, as we are affectionately known, um, for about the past eight years. Um, prior to that, I worked um, for the Secretary of Housing and Economic Development. I was part of a policy and planning team um, that was responsible for driving then Governor Patrick's um, agenda around um, expanding uh, gaming in Massachusetts and building out the infrastructure network that would bring high-speed internet to Western Massachusetts and the Cape and the Islands. Um, and I graduated from McCormick School in 2015. And again, really pleased to be here with all of you, albeit virtually. That's great. Thank you so much. I'm really glad that you're able to be here. Um, and Nathan. Hey everybody, my name's uh, Nathan Aiken. Uh, thank you very much for having me and uh, thank you for coming. <laughs> um, I graduated from the International Relations Program back in 2019, so it's been uh, almost two years now. Um, right now, I work uh, at Decision Technologies as a contractor, but I'm embedded in the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Legislative Affairs uh, at the Department of Defense. Um, so basically, that's a big mouthful, but uh, what my team does on strategic communications, uh, I'm a congressional research analyst, is basically we monitor and pro provide support to the Secretary of Defense and Deputy Secretary of Defense for all of their engagements with Capitol Hill. So that can be, um, you know, representatives, senators, um, or even um, some of their engagements with um, uh, governors as well. So for example, one of the big things that we've been covering a lot lately are the posture hearings, uh, both on the uh, House Armed Services Committee and Senate Armed Services, Services Committee uh, in preparation for the uh, 2022 NDAA. Um, so I've been you know, covering all those hearings, basically writing info memos, um, what's being said, what senators' concerns are or representatives' concerns are, and basically uh, being able to get that information to um, you know, the Secretary of Defense's office so that uh, you know, they know what's going on and uh, that they can better implement the department's um, overall goals and priorities. Um, so I've probably been here, I think it's going on um, eight months now, um, but yeah, definitely a uh, interesting position. Great, great, welcome and thank you. Um, and so we, I see that um, it looks like Charlotte is working on spotlighting everybody. That's either Charlotte or Kelly working behind the scenes to get that sorted out so you can more easily find the people who are speaking. Um, and so finally, we have two of our Conflict Resolution uh, Masters alum with us. Uh, Ify, would you like to introduce yourself? Um, good evening, everyone. Um, so I'm Ify. Um, uh, currently working in Abuja, Nigeria. So I run Clean Technology Hub, which I founded in 2016. Um, prior to that, I was working for the Nigerian government for a number of years. 
um, working with some of our ministers, first the Minister of Finance and then the Minister of um, um, Energy. And my hub really is a hybrid hub that focuses on research, um, policy, advocacy, training, um, community engagement and enterprise development. And what we do is we're looking at ways to uh, build sustainability um, around uh, using electricity energy access really through renewable energy uh, to make it simpler um, in communities that are not electrified in Nigeria and also working on a lot of our climate targets um, as a country. Uh, currently the hub um, works in is active in 11 countries physically present in seven other countries but working with other partner hubs across 11 countries. Um, so happy to be here and happy to reconnect with everybody uh, from the program. Thank you. Great. Nice to see you back here. And finally, uh, our other uh, Conflict Resolution Masters alum, Teresa. Hi, thank you so much for having me. And I share the sentiments that others have said. It's so nice to see um, so many familiar faces. It does feel, um, I don't know, it feels very comforting. Um, I graduated in 2008 from the program and since then have done a number of things, but mostly I'm, I'm uh, in my 10th year of being an ombuds. I did uh, ombuds work for the American Red Cross. I'm now working in the University of Colorado, Denver and Anschutz medical campuses. Um, and as ombuds, what, what we do is really do a lot of uh, conflict coaching, mediation, group facilitations, uh, trainings on conflict resolution and communication skills, you name it and uh, provide those services to faculty, students, and staff. So everything we learned in the program, I'm definitely using every day. Um, I also later went on to get a certificate in uh, organization consulting and change management from Georgetown. And th the two combined have really helped me for sure. Great, well, welcome. So uh, folks, these are, this is our panel of alumni from the different uh, programs uh, in the department and you get a sense of the wide range of different kinds of things that our, our alumni go on to do. Um, and so the format here is, um, Kelly had reached out to our student body in general with what kinds of questions do you have? What would you like to hear from the panel? And so we selected, uh, really Kelly did, three of the, the um, particular, uh, actually, I'm sorry, two two particular questions that really stood out and seemed to um, represent what a lot of qu students were asking about. So I'm going to pose one of these questions to four of you, uh, and then the other question to three of you. So we get a range of different kinds of responses to these things. And then after that, we'll go into breakouts by the different programs. So we'll have a, bro a breakout for the global governance and human security crowd, a breakout for the IR crowd and a breakout for the conflict resolution crowd. Um, and once I open the breakout rooms, you'll be able to choose which one to go to. Um, and if you feel like hopping from group to group, you are welcome to do so. You don't have to go uh, where assigned because I know that a lot of our programs cross over a lot. Our students cross over a lot when they take classes. You come here and you discover interests you didn't know you had before. So feel free to explore and, and hop around a bit if you'd like. So the first question, and this is for uh, Jeremiah, Natalia, Abigail, and Ify. Um, if you'd each take a couple of minutes with this question. And it's, what advice do you have about finding a specific career that matches one's own personal interests? You all got unique different kinds of interests that there aren't necessarily cookie cutter jobs out there for. What advice do you have to offer our current students about finding a specific career that matches your interests? So maybe Jeremiah, you could take the first swing at this. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, so this one, I'll just give one, one um, answer that I think um, will work for my case and the rest can uh, chip in. Um, I'll talk about um, adaptability because um, from my own experience, it's very hard to get a job that, the one that you really, really want. It's, from my experience, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's almost impossible. So uh, you have to be willing to adapt 
And so you don't go really out of your way per se, but uh, you kind of, uh, the best way to do it is look at a job that's closely related to your interests and then um, find your way in there and then try to adapt into the system. So for example, um, the first job I got, and this might not really, for outsiders, it might look like it's not really out of the way, but the first job I got was a, a global studies um, job and it involved teaching mainly, primarily teaching. And I was gonna teach things like cross-cultural experiences. So things that basically I am not really qualified to teach. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so you, I don't know whether you get the hang of it. Yes, yeah, so, but if you're willing to adapt, then um, I think it can take you a long way. Yeah, because even my current position, um, I'm in security studies, but it's mainly Homeland Security. And so it's like coming from human security and going to national security. And you know, those are very philosophically different things. So you have to find a way of um, fitting in and so I leverage on the knowledge on human security to fit in. And then the skills I got from the department and throughout my, uh, my career to fit in. So adaptability is one of the things that I would put out there. Um, yes. Great, thank you. Uh, Natalia, would you take a shot at this question? Thank you. Uh, I have to say as well that, that my case is particularly different in many ways because I first I work in a department of international business where everybody asks like why what is the area of international relations and global governance doing in a school of management in a department of international business and of course it obeys to to different issues and reasons and, and I believe that it fits and it fits very well so that is a, one important issue about my context that I think that is relevant here. And also the fact that when I joined the program, I knew from the beginning that I was going back to my job that was like the, the same, not the same, it wasn't going to be the same job, but I knew from the start that, that I was going to go back to my original position and I continue working in, in different projects at, at my university uh, for the six years that I was uh, at UMA. So that those are two important things here. I think that that the the advice that I think that is important is is to find something that really connects to how you want to contribute to your career, to your discipline, or to uh, the field in, in which you are interested. In. For me, uh, I arrived to academia to the university I work for right now having worked for about 10 or so years in the public sector, in the private sector, I ended up figuring out that international relations was my jam, let's say. And then I uh, found this program that was perfect for me and that ended up being exactly what I needed because I was looking for something that combined the theory and the practice and that allowed me to engage into the policy world because that was the world I was coming from and because that connected to the work that I was doing uh, back then. So uh, the, the most important advice there is, is to find specifically that what you want and, and go from there and, and find that contribution. I had tried the private sector and I knew that the for-profit uh, work was not for me. I have uh, paid my duties to my country and, and work for the public sector in, in different uh, levels at the state government, at the national government, and, and I didn't want to, to do that. But academia was that field where, where I knew that I can make a contribution that I can see uh, in my students, in my research, in the work that I do. And of course, the program, the PhD program allowed me to be part of, of a super solid network of researchers that is that has that engagement. I, I found that, and many of you know my story. I joined the program even before I start, be, before it started. I met Maria at a conference and I jumped in into uh, uh, getting to learn more about this. And 
and and I figured that that was exactly what I wanted because it had that combination and it's still today uh, 10 years later it has like that connection and and that linkage with the policy world and that possibility of networking of continue working with Maria with the center that has been central to to my career and that that really provided me that opportunity for engaging so probably probably that will be my advice to find to find that where you can do that contribution and where you can really engage and and be flexible uh, know that that is that many of these processes that jeremiah were saying are not easy but you need to adjust and and to have that flexibility and to continue building those connections in the academia and in the policy world to to support your work and 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 the the contributions that that you want to make that's great thank you thank you um abby thank you yeah always oh, great to be able to reconnect um i wanted to add to what jeremiah said about adaptability and i want to speak to my current situation um I work in a very technical statistical center. We do forecasting using an integrated assessment model. So it doesn't just take um, one aspect like an environmental model that in fact is focused on the environment. This one takes in development politics, political aspect, infrastructure, name it. It's a very massive model. And so when I moved out here in Denver, I was still doing my PhD and I didn't, um, I didn't, I wasn't sure what I was going to do because uh, there's not a lot of uh, international uh, politics, global affairs um, institutions to work at. And so when I looked at the centers within Cobell, I realized that I, I could fit in at the Paddy Center and I could make a contribution in my own way, bringing my own unique skills. So about adaptability. So I adapted myself and opened my mind to learning new things. And so I've had to learn how to use the model and understand it and be able to write about it and advise policymakers and government officials. And so it's very key once you're found in a situation to be able to adapt and um, learn new skills and you know to do your work and uh, things that you interest you. But Coming back to my own, um, how I've approached my career and building my brand, so to say, or like how I have found myself where I am. When I went to undergrad, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I was enrolled in a BA, Arts and Education, and I enjoyed reading my literature books and learning about literature from other countries. But when I was there, I realized the, the things that really spoke to me are you know, international studies things, um, global affairs. I wanted to do something about armed conflict in Southern Africa because Zambia at that time was receiving a lot of refugees. And I thought, oh, that's what spoke to me. But I had a challenge. I didn't have the education to match those, that interest that I had. So I didn't have conflict resolution. There was no conflict resolution at the university I went to. Um, there was no any study of armed conflict apart from, from a historical point of view. And so when I went for a master's degree at the University of Cape Town, I tailored my courses to the interest that I wanted. That is conflict resolution and also peace and security in the region. There wasn't a specific program there, but I could take courses like conflict theory and practice of conflict resolution. I could do, I could study conflicts from the historical side of you, genocide. So I took courses across uh, politics and history just to be able to, uh, to build um, the career and the in, in the, using the interest that I, I had. And so that's how I have kind of worked around um, building my career and the interests that I have. And so the education part is important, but I would also want to say uh, practical skills are important. So from my first studies at um, 
in the rest of Cape Town, and particularly when I did the theory and practice of conflict resolution, an opportunity opened up for me to work at the government of the department of a premier of the Western government, which is like working for the governor here in the US. There I, I, I put my skills, conflict resolution skills set into practice. I worked with the, the, the premier's government uh, bringing together uh, different stakeholders to address xenophobia and that was early 2008. And then I also looked for opportunities where I could gain more skills, uh, knowing that I didn't have a proper qualification to work in the field of uh, just conflict resolution or peace and security. So I would have also like maybe work at the Conf uh, Center for Conflict Resolution, which is which was a major think tank at that time where I also expanded my skill set. Um, I can go into detail later in the breakout room, but another thing I wanted to, to highlight is also choosing mentors. The other things that I can talk about like uh, um, networking is also important as you build, build yourself in the career. But the one thing that I also found really, really useful is the mentors and uh, advisors um, surrounding yourself with people that believe in you, people that know where you want to go is very important. And I've been very fortunate in my career to, you know, to be advised and mentored by people like um, Tim Shaw and Jan Papad. And here I have Kiki and Maria. And so it's, um, it's very important in the sense that you choose people that you that mentor you carefully because then they advise you on how to build the skill set that you need. And also they uh, give good red recommendations, which you also need to get a job. <laughs> but yeah, the mentors have been a, a huge, I've played a huge part in my life in the sense that they, they have forced me to do things I would not do. One particular thing, and I know perhaps Tim and Jen don't know this, I didn't want to go to ISA before when I just started the program. <laughs> and so Tim and Jen, they, you have to go to ISA, you have to present something. But because they understood where I wanted to go and they understood the interest that I had, perhaps even understood much more in terms of my career trajectory than I understood. And they saw the, 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 the contribution that ISA would make in my life. And so, out of my going to INSA, I've expanded my network. I've made exceptional people in the field of international studies and conflict resolution, peace and security. So I would say that um, mentoring is a big part of it. But so I'll, I'll end there, but I have more if we continue having this discussion. Great, thank you. Uh, and finally, on this question, Ify. So, um... Thank you. I, I will be brief. Um, I came into the conflict resolution program as a lawyer. I was already a practicing lawyer in Nigeria when I ran into a member of the faculty, uh, Darren Q, who had walked into our office doing his postdoctoral research, I think at the time. And I remember sitting down at the Lagos multi-door courthouse. Uh, for those of you who know the multi-door courthouse systems that was st started by uh, Professor Sanders from the Harvard uh, Law School. Um, we modeled um, multi-door courthouses after him. And the first one was in Lagos, which is the New York of you know, the United States. Um, so Darren had walked into the office to see my boss and um, was asking a lot of questions about the work we were doing. And I, I think I, in typical Ify fashion, I completely took over the interview and started to ask him all sorts of questions. Um, and he was really fascinated about, wow, this, I think I must have been 20 or so at the time. I was just right out of law school. Um, and he said to me, sorry, who did you say you were again? I was like, oh, I just started working here, but I'm really fascinated about your work and some of the things you're saying. And he gave me his card and he said, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm teaching at a school called University of Massachusetts, Boston. Um, if you're ever interested in doing a graduate program, why don't you write me an email? Because we have a, a conflict res dispute resolution program, which is what it was called at the time. Um, maybe you could come do a master's there. I said, oh, okay, um, took the card. 
never did anything with it. And then three years later, I think I sent him an email. And that became the catalyst of how I ended up in, in Boston. Um, and I tell that story because my career has sort of moved from being a lawyer. Um, one of the things I knew that I did not want to do was be into litigation, which is, or into commercial law practice. So my experience having done a bit of that in Nigeria and then having worked in the multi doc courthouse and had a bit of um, insight into mediation, arbitration, um, um, you know, uh, mixed systems of uh, dispute resolution um, fascinated me, um, but was, I also wasn't quite sure what I could do with that. So coming into the program, I think one of the things that I sort of tried to do every time I took a course um, was to sort of take out things that I, I think I liked from each course that I, I, I take. I specifically remember um, the mediation classes that David taught us. Uh, and I say this to my team in Nigeria all the time, because we do, we, you, you would be amazed about how much mediation we do in the work that we do. I mean, we're building electricity in rural communities across sub-Saharan Africa, right? How difficult could that be? But the amount of you know, mediation you'd have to do, the amount of negotiation you have to do, even for the land that you have to get to build, you know, to install solar panels, um, even for simple things like who's going to be in charge of what. Um, one of the things I always say to the team is, you know, uh, watch the feet. If they're always, if they're still in the room, that means we still have a chance. And this was something I, I remember from David's class, right? So you'll be surprised about how you take little things, or is it the moral exclusion classes that we took with Susan? Um, I could tell you, I could do a whole lecture on moral exclusion when it comes to energy access and climate change. Um, but these are some of the things that I think that drive my work, that I, I have a note where every time I had a lecture or a class, I sort of took out two things that I had learned from that class, wasn't quite sure how I was going to apply it, but sort of figured out that sometimes the fact that these things were the things that resonated with me, I might be able to use them somehow in the work that I do. So even when I graduated from the master's program, I sort of uh, floundered a bit. I did a, a couple of other master's programs and tried to get into the PhD program, wasn't successful. Um, worked in you know, healthcare in Boston, worked at the Boston Public Health Commission, worked at Genzyme, uh, which has now been bought over by Sanofi uh, Aventis. Um, but my, I think my turning point was when I was at Genzyme because I then found two people who became my promoters. Um, and one of them, my boss then, Alice Pomponio, who was a senior vice president, remains one of my best friends still today, um, because she was the senior vice president for global policy. And it was interesting because every time she would be asking me, I was you know, still teaching uh, and going to school part-time at UMass Boston while I was at Genzyme. But she'd be asking me questions around um, some of, because I had to submit my transcripts to get that job and be asking me questions around mediation and negotiations and some of the concepts that we learned there and using that to sort of mainstream the work that we're doing um, as a large, you know, rare disease, often drug manufacturer at the time um, in terms of how we were moving into other different markets and into different countries. And that fascinated me. And so that was what taught me that, you know, things that I learned could be adaptable and applicable even in the non-linear context. So this was private sector, this was healthcare, biotech. Um, but here I was with a boss who was very well read, by the way. I mean, she had a PhD from MIT. She had gone to the Kennedy School. You know, she had gotten her first degree from Stanford, but found a way to sort of get my learnings around my dispute resolution degree into the work that we did. Um, and that, that was a, a turning point for me in terms of how I utilized that degree. So that even now that I'm doing something completely different from biotech and have something different from um, healthcare, um, and I'm working in difficult communities and how to reach communities, I take those lessons with me that those things that I, I sort of uh, put down in those notebooks and that resonated with me, are principles, guiding principles from those courses that I could sort of apply to my day-to-day -day activities and my work. 
and I'll say this because I think a lot of uh, the other, my other um, alums have, have repeated it. It is important to remain flexible and adaptable. Like I said, I met a lot of fumbles trying to find my feet and I'm happy where I've landed. But one of the things that I always, um, uh, uh, I always, that always stayed with me was what Alice, who's um, my friend and my sister said to me was when I was moving back to Nigeria and even when I moved back, and I kept saying to her, oh, I don't like the fact that I'm working for the government. You know, I had, the, I had a hard time. And she says, well, if you just find one of the things, one thing that makes you really, really angry and then try and change it. And for me, that thing was really the, just the abysmal, you know, electricity access we had here. After living in the US for so many years and having taken electricity for granted, having to come here and deal with, you know, perennial power cuts um, and not being able to plan and organize my life in the way that I, 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 I was used to. Um, it then made me think, well, maybe this is something that uh, I should focus on. And then how then do we do that? Because if the grid isn't working, are there other means of maybe getting power into the hands of people? And that's how the idea around, well, maybe using renewable energy uh, to do this work uh, could be my pathway. And then beginning increasingly to work uh, at rem in remote communities where power isn't the only problem. Poverty is, the, is also a problem. So looking at how then do I use renewable energy to empower people um, to start up businesses, to start up, you know, um, what small scale businesses to, to begin to sort of transform those communities and to address issues around human security, you know, um, gender rights. Um, and that's what my hub, you know, has been doing for the past five, six years now. And it's interesting that every time we've done something, you know, we're invited by someone else from another country to come partner and open up uh, a, a subset of the hub um, and, and replicate the work that we do in those countries. And that creates a whole nother range of negotiations that we have to sort of embody because we're entering into a new environment and into a new culture and into a new um, um, ways of doing. Um, and those same principles, are there still seats in the room? Is there still a pathway here? Those things still guide us. The, the whole theory around moral exclusion, who are we leaving out of the table? How do we bring them into the table? Um, you know, um, some of Evan's courses around data, you know, um, what, what, what is the data really saying? How do we, how do we even, I mean, that was the first data course that I took. How do we even uh, interpret those data? Um, so my, my takeaway from having done this program is, you know, you, you have to be very uh, deliberate about what you think you're learning from the program. And those things that stick with you and stay with you are the principles that will guide you into the career choices that you'd make um, at the end of the day. And that has, that's what has helped me get to where I am today. So I'll stop this here. And if there are questions, you know, much later in the breakout room, I'll be very happy to answer them. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank, thank you to the four of you that, that dug into that question. And if there are, I mean, I guess there's two themes that, that cut across. One is you're all amazing. And the other is um, the, the question of adaptability. There, there are no straight lines here. You know, and uh, we're, we're, this is not such a cut and dry field, right? You didn't all train to, you know, do just one thing. And it has meant carving out space, being adaptable, finding some place to fit to make the thing that you wanted to do work. Um, and it's, it's really extraordinary. And, and I think it, it really, it paints a really great picture. Um, of, of what it takes. Um, so that's really helpful. So I'm going to shift to another question for our other three alumni guests. Um, and this is for Nathan, Andrew, and Teresa. And the question is about going about the job search. And, and when you started your job search, how did you brand yourself? Abby used that, that phrase. When you started your job search, how did you brand yourself? And how did you portray your degree to help support that brand. These are not the most commonly held degrees, right? So how did you portray your degree to support that brand? And also, did you encounter any difficulties during the, the application process? Um, so, and Kelly has just dropped that question in the chat. Thank you. So um, Nathan, would you take a first stab at that question? Yeah, sure. Thank you. 
Um, so I think that one, obviously the topic of branding yourself is very personal and unique to every person. Uh, you know, everyone's coming with a different background, different experiences, different amount of education. Um, so I think, first of all, you really need to know like who you are and how you want to portray yourself. Uh, so for example, when I was starting to look for jobs as I was just about to graduate uh, from the graduate program, um, you know, I was 25, I, you know, was getting my graduate degree. So I had a lot of education, but at the time I didn't have as much practical experience. So what I really tried to highlight as I was going through my job search was kind of the skills that the program had given me. So specifically, um, you know, communication, written, oral, um, you know, that tied with research and analysis, you know, things that the program did for me and, you know, that I could kind of back up with specific examples, be it, uh, you know, projects that I worked on in certain classes or papers that I'd written. So that was really what I tried to kind of brand myself as, is, you know, a young individual who was, um, you know, educated, but, you know, looking to really sink my teeth into, um, you know, some, some real work and get involved. And that's, I think it worked for me, but uh, really what I tried to highlight. Um, and I think, you know, what I really used the degree for in terms of that branding was more so kind of backing it up. So, you know, when you go into interviews, I could talk about all these skills that I had. And then I used to use, you know, any examples that I had um, from my classes or internships or previous experiences to kind of back up where I've gained those skills and, you know, kind of how I use them on an everyday sort of basis. Um, and I guess in terms of, you know, any difficulties I had in my own job search, um, this was particular to me, but a lot of the jobs that I was looking at and interested at the time um, had, uh, you needed to have a security clearance. So that was a really difficult uh, kind of obstacle for me to uh, get over or, or get through rather, just because, you know, regardless of my own abilities, if I didn't have that clearance, I, you know, really wasn't even going to be looked at for the job. Um, so that was something, um, you know, kind of, I guess, in everyone's search, uh, you kind of need to be aware of what you're looking for, what you want, and if you do kind of meet those criteria. I'm always a big fan of applying very broadly. You never know who's going to like your experiences. Um, but I think it also helps to know, um, you know, exactly what you might be getting into. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my take on how I branded myself um, when I was uh, applying to jobs. That's great. I love it. Um, Andrew. What was your experience with that? Yeah, you know, I think I would echo a lot of sort of the themes that, um, that Nathan and, and panelists in the first panel sort of um, raised, which is just sort of the importance of, uh, you know, coming out of a liberal arts education and, you know, this being a, a sort of graduate um, crowd, you know, you all have just tremendously transferable skills that can be utilized and applied in a variety of, you know, situations. And, and certainly that was um, my approach to sort of the career search. Um, you know, I think back, you know, really to sort of when I was coming out of my, my undergraduate degree and was sort of looking to get into a professional organization. And at the time, my sort of, you know, qualifications were that, you know, I had graduated college and my work experience was, you know, working as a bike messenger. And so I was deeply fearful that sort of, I was, you know, never going to be able to sort of advance into um, that world. But, you know, um, you know, as Nathan said, sort of using your degree as a credential and a way to sort of substantiate um, that you have these skills um, is, I think, is a sort of a good way of going about it. You know, I think of sort of um, coming out of grad school sort of empowered me to, you know, synthesize information, um, you know, communicate well, um, sort of like remain organized um, and sort of juggle multiple tasks um, and working with people. I mean, sort of the fact that this is a crowd who has specialization in conflict resolution and mediation and negotiation, I mean, that is sort of like critically important for wherever you end up because wherever you end up you're going to be working with people and there's inevitably going to be sort of just tensions because people see things and they all we all have different perspectives and that's really important but sort of being able to navigate that um, is just you know I think really going to put um, this crowd you know ahead um, 
And and I would echo I would echo a lot of what I heard in in the first panel. I you know I think it can't be overstated the importance of just being sort of flexible and adaptable. I think um, you know myself and and many of my colleagues and friends. You know I, I think there is this sort of tendency towards like rigidity, and when you sort of start to to tense up and sort of get so narrow minded in in thinking. Um, you know, it sort of sets you up for failure and it, it, it's, it's, I think, just going to lead to a lot of frustration. So sort of like being sort of open to experiences and um, sort of like to, to look around and consider different, different options, I, I think is, is going to serve you well in, in the long term. So you really sort of um, just echo and emphasize the, the importance of adaptability and flexibility. Great, thank you, Andrew. That's really helpful. Um, and finally, Teresa, your experience with branding. Sure. You know, it's interesting. When I first saw this question, I didn't. Um, I thought to myself, I didn't. I didn't brand myself. Um, but then I, I really thought about it and realized that that wasn't true. And one of the things that for me, I think I uh, kind of honed in on. My undergrad was also in conflict resolution. Um, but I felt that from my undergrad, I got a lot of the theoretical basis. And from the master's program, I felt I got a lot of the practice. We did mediations, you know, small claims court mediations. We did a lot of facilitation simulations. I felt like I left the program having done the work um, in some ways. And so I, I like to brand myself that way of I have both the theoretical and the practical experience. Um, and I also like to brand the idea that I have a broad range of skills coaching, mediation, facilitation, and I can tailor approaches to the needs that come that come up. Um, some of the difficulties I ran into was I, you know, I graduated in 2008. It was not the best time for the job market. Um, and uh, similar to what what Nathan said as well, I was very young in my career at the time, kind of in my my early to mid 20s. Um, but and similar to what Ify was saying, I found myself in a job that I wasn't necessarily, this isn't really what I want to be doing. I was working as a personal lines underwriter for an insurance company. Um, but I started thinking, okay, how can I start applying these skills even here? So I get even more comfortable. I let my manager know this was my background. And so they gave me the most difficult group of agents to work with. So I was constantly negotiating. I was on the phone with people yelling at me every single day. So it was all about negotiation, trying to find those underlying interests. How can we meet the interests of both your, your clients as well as you know, the organization to make money? How do, we, how do we find that? Got to really get used to the skills. Um, and if there were any issues of people on my team, my boss sent them to me. I essentially was doing mediation and conflict coaching, was doing ombuds work there at you know the regional office at nationwide insurance um but then in the meantime because i knew i wanted to get out of that and into this line of work um i continued to supplement what i was doing um i did um community volunteer community mediation volunteer community restorative justice work and i continued trainings restorative justice training conflict coaching trainings and i did a lot of networking um, and Abigail spoke to this as well. I talked to as many people as I could about the things that I wanted to do. I made sure people knew where it was I wanted to go. A lot of informational interviews. Um, and my first role as an ombuds at the American Rod Cross, I believe was a direct result of conversations I had had with other another UMass um, conflict resolution grad. Um, and even the current role I have now at the University of uh, Colorado, um, I had done a lot of volunteer work directly with my coworker for years. And so applying for the job, knowing that we were going to have to be doing trainings together and mediations together, we already knew that we worked well together. So that networking piece is really important. But, but I think that branding piece, I and I still, even when I talk to people within the organization I work for, I still brand myself as someone who will come in, take a look at the situation, big picture, and I will tailor an approach to what it is that you need. I'm not gonna just treat the presenting problem either, which people get really mad at me for, right? They just want someone to come in and do the quick fix, um, but that's not that's not gonna be me. I'm gonna find the underlying root issue and, and go there and it's gonna get messy. Um, so I would say that that's how I would answer those questions. 
Fantastic. So I'm, what I'm hearing is a lot of resourcefulness and creativity about, you know, making those connections between theory and practice and being able to brand and market yourself that way. Um, from all of you, the, the building the career and the resume step by step. Um, I've been doing a lot of uh, meetings this the last week or two with, with students who are getting closer to graduating and are thinking about that. And I've been talking about the same sort of stuff, you know, if you can volunteer here or there, if you could do something for a hundred bucks and they'll let you facilitate something, you know, if you can pick up a training here and there, the sort of the building little bits that they, they add up over time, the little bits of experience and you can really leverage them. Um, that's really terrific. The other thing that I heard just in what Teresa was saying at the end that I think is so important is the use of our alumni network. Um, you know, Teresa, your experience is, you know, wonderful and not unique. We've, I've heard so many times over the years we all have about our students, they stay in touch, they find students from different generations uh, in the department and help each other out. Um, and I think this event is just a wonderful way to sort of step that up a notch and push that forward and make those connections. So um, before we go into breakouts, I just want to say just a huge thank you to the seven of you for uh, all of what you've shared. And so great to be able to listen to all of you talk again for at a, like a more extended piece than I've had a chance to in, in years since you've been off flying around the world doing your own thing. So this is really fun for me personally, too. Um, what I'm going to do now is uh, open up the breakout rooms again. Uh, they're set up by department. Um, and so you can go and talk to people who are maybe a little bit closer to your field, but um, you're certainly welcome to go to um, to hop around uh, over the course of time um, or to go where you're not supposed to be. That's fine. Um, and um, we I will bring you all back to the main room at uh, 10 to 7 for a quick rack, wrap up before we go. All right. So the breakout rooms are open and feel free to choose one and go. How do, how do we know? What's that? They are not. Uh, if, you, if you click on the, it should be a breakouts, a breakout rooms button at the bottom of your screen. Got it. Oh my goodness. It has been so great to hear from all of you. Um, uh, Andrew and Nathan and Abby and Jeremiah, Ify, Teresa, Natalia. Did I get all of you? Thank you so much. Really great to see all of you again. Great to hear about the experiences you've been having, the paths you've cut. I know this is tremendously, I mean, for all of us on the faculty getting to see you again, is just a huge kick, but I, I know also for- A lot of Sub-Saharan Africa is on, elect on electrified. About uh, 700 million people don't have electricity in Sub-Saharan Africa. And that's because we have a very weak grid systems. Um, and almost 60% of that population lives in rural communities. So think about it this way. Um, we know that the grid, there isn't money to build new grids, new grid systems the way that we have in the West or we have in Southeast Asia. Um, and the easiest way to get electricity into the hands of people is to look at renewable energy, mainly through solar or biomass. So we're going into these communities that don't have light, don't have water, um, are pretty much cut off from civilization, as you may call it. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we do is, first of all, you can't even just walk into those communities without even having some sort of cultural context, which is where a lot of the cross-cultural conflict resolution courses come in, right? Then you're having some sort of uh, framework for how you engage. Um, then you begin to have that sort of... Uh, um, you begin to have some other uh, conversations around negotiations. What do you want to do? How do you want to do it? What, how does this affect the community? Who are the gatekeepers? Um, who are the people that you know are going to be your, um, who are the influencers? Who are the people who are influential and who can make things happen for you? That's where the negotiation comes in. And then during the project, you're probably going to have different uh, people or different um, members of the same community probably fighting over you know, petty things. That's where the mediation comes in, right? So you've 
you see that, and then of course you're you're working with a team of people who are, you know, like where sometimes we, I have to go into those communities or even when I'm outside Nigeria working um, and we're there for three weeks, I'm not with my family, I'm very frazzled. Of course, then the workplace conflict comes in because you're really very frustrated with your teammates. Things aren't going as planned, as on schedule. That's when the workplace conflict resolution comes in. So at every point in time, you see that you have some tool that you have taken from this program that you can sort of apply to your everyday situation. Yeah. And even though what I'm doing is project development, there is no course that I have to. And then of course, when you come back and you're crunching the numbers, um, that's when all the research courses um, and then the data courses you've, you've taken comes in, right? So. I mean, there's no course that I, I didn't find useful or I don't find useful in terms of what I do today. Yeah. Thank you so much. It helps a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Of course. You have two more hands up, I think, two more questions. Uh, one is from Joko and then the other is from Prince. Yeah, I think Prince is first, I think. Hello well, today. Uh, Eben, good to see you. Um, Jeremiah, I know I have to reach out, but I'm not in um, Houston or Austin anymore. I'm actually in New Orleans, um, but I will reach out. I have a phone number. Um, well, congratulations, guys. It's very uh, inspiring to see you all today. Um, I've been in the conflict resolution program. I miss it. And, and, and it's really amazing to see the work that you guys are doing today. I'm actually in the DGHS program for uh, those who don't know, especially um, um, uh, who was it? Uh, Ify. Yes, for Ify. So I, I went on LinkedIn at the moment. So your profile, very amazing. I'm very fascinated by the work that you're doing. Um, myself, I'm, I'm from Africa. I'm from Congo Brazzaville. So uh, you mm. talked about electricity and this is a problem that we have as well. So, you know, just to congratulate you guys today, I sent you um, a connection request on LinkedIn and I hope to connect with you because I'm, I'm, I'm doing uh, global government security, but I'm very interested in like energy Actually, I'm working with Professor Stacy on renewable energy programs in uh, Uganda. Dennis Jugo is in the same uh, project as well. So it's something very interesting for me to see the work that you guys are doing in Nigeria, because I have those ideas and I feel like this is something that uh, us, especially as Africans, we can implement in our countries. So I look forward to connecting with you and seeing how we can move forward with whatever we come, come up with. Um, Jeremiah, you have a great day, but I will reach out. I'm, I'm sorry again. Uh, Professor Abigail, hi, and <laughs> congratulations again to everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Dennis. Thanks, Prince. Uh, uh, you know, thank you so much. I think uh, I should thank the people that put this together. And uh, Kelly, I think, uh, is the agent. <laughs> you know, behind <laughs> organizing all this, and even it's good to see you after after a year, I think. <laughs> you know, and uh, and Lee as well, but also other people. I think Abigail with uh, also in the first uh, uh, different uh, forum, and uh, Jeremiah, of course, with the work that we are currently also doing together. Uh, I, I'm fascinated by what you guys are doing, including Ife. Uh, but my question is specific on, you know, on career growth and where we see ourselves, we as young scholars in the GGS program. And I'm interested in knowing what are the specific things that you did that you were doing when you were still at our level? Because I know Jeremiah, at least, Rumor has it, it's all over in the corridors that you are the person who, you, that you are the person who has finished the PhD in the shortest possible time, and you were able to get yourself a, a, a tenure track uh, uh, a professorship at some distance. But also Abigail, the amazing work you did in the Horn of Africa, uh, security in the Horn of Africa, and how you got uh, 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 to the university where you are. Uh, I'm just interested in knowing because I'm a kind of guy who also wants to pursue a career uh, in the academia and I'm just positioning myself for that. But I'm wondering if at all at this level, because I'm in my second year, if at all at this level, there are some things that I'm supposed to be doing to prepare myself perfectly for that, that I'm not doing. And so I'm curious to know what you did when you were still in your first year, second year, third year, 
you know, when you're still at all those levels, all stages in your PhD career at UMass. Thank you so much. So I don't know whether to go fast or I let Abby <laughs> go. Abby, you want to go fast? Sure, I can, I can go. Thank you. So Dennis, <laughs> your question is so pertinent. It's, I think it's at the heart of uh, career search. And um, I wasn't at the level that you are right now thinking about these things, and I wish I was. <laughs> so I really congratulate you for that question because it's an important one. So one of the things that I did when I was a student, and uh, I would have done more to you know, try and connect my, position myself to getting maybe a tenure track job or the kind of job that I, I would have wanted. So I think one of the early things was I started networking. Networking is um, an important aspect. From the get go, I, 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 want, I work with people um, who are academics, who are non-academics because there was at some point where I wasn't sure whether I was going to do it go into a full-time career, academic career or policy. So I was networking on both ends, like academia and on the policy front. But and another thing is publication. And this one I cannot emphasize anymore. And um, I think we could have done a bit more when in our cohort to emphasize publications. And even when I think I was told by my mentor that I need to publish, but I did not understand the seriousness. And the reason why I did not understand the seriousness, no, I did not understand the job market. And what you're doing now is really good because then you understand what it means to go in a, um, into an academic track uh, career and the things that you need to align yourself up. One of them is, uh, you know, publication. There's no, there's no way of going around that if you want to get a tenure track uh, position in academia. The other one is uh, conferences. That's a, you have to learn to present, putting your ideas together and conferences give an opportunity to network. So I went to conferences and thankfully I had Professor Shaw who like, you know, just he told me you need to go to conferences and he would send opportunities around. Like one of them uh, was the academic council on, on the United Nations system. I didn't even know about that. Tim sent it to me. He said, you must apply. <laughs> and I applied and I, I went and I went twice. So that's those kinds of opportunities are really important. I know it's very hard when you're doing PhD to think about conferences and writing papers for those conferences, just because it's, it's a lot of work. You have you already have a lot of work to do and thinking about writing for papers, especially that are not related to your coursework, it's, it's time consuming. So you need to find the time and sacrifice and, and write those papers and publish. If you uh, can publish a sole author, paper, that's great. If you can publish with others, that's great. The most important thing, you must have something published. Teaching opportunities. We are lucky in this, um, in this um, program, we have the teaching opportunities, like Jeremiah had mentioned, you know, to be able to, to be a teaching assistant. Other programs don't have that. But if you're able to teach a course and get evaluations from that course, that is also great. I know there's, uh, what is that, Oli? You know about Oli, Dennis? If you can teach a course there at Oli, practice that, have um, some uh, evaluations, keep them well, you know, take the course seriously, teach it well and have very good evaluations. You're gonna need them. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me end here and give Jeremiah an opportunity to come in, but I can always come back to the question. Great. Yeah, thanks. So I think Ali has, I mean, Abby has given all the great advice, <laughs> but I, I think I know I know Dennis a little more, and um, I can tell you you're on the right track. Because what Dennis is not telling everyone here is that um, 
is there's a book I'm working on and he's actually one of the contributors. He has a chapter in there. So, <laughs> so he's way ahead of even myself when I was there. So, <laughs> so that's, that's really great because yes, um, it, and like I, I said, I wasn't there. So um, I think I'll use my own experience and my own experience is take it as an anecdote because my, my road to getting a tenure track position. So let me just give you, a, I started applying for a job in, um, I think it was the fall of 2016. I was an ABD there. And I got my tenure track job in the spring of 2019. Oh, wow. mm -hmm. So you can see that period. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it might look like it's it's quick, easy, and but yeah. And from my own experience, all the things Abia said are correct. But I don't know whether there's a magic bullet to getting it. I yeah, I would just use my experience to tell you. And then so what I feel worked for me was um, one. The, the teaching that Abby talked about, I, I took the, of course there was a TA, I was part of a, uh, a fellowship, I got fellowship, which did not require us to teach. So I actually finished my entire PhD without teaching. Mm -hmm. So I, I requested the uh, department chair at the time, who was Sami, if I could teach, if he could get me at least one semester of teaching. Mm -hmm. So I came back, in the spring of 2017 to teach a course from political science department, international relations okay. and uh, co-teach, not really teach. But during that time, I also applied for the, the lifelong institute. OSHA yeah. Lifelong institute. Yeah. Yeah, so that same, same semester I actually taught the OSHA, uh, only actually, only, Oli is yeah, a lifelong life learning yeah. institute, yes. Yeah. I, I, I taught that and I also uh, served as a teaching assistant for the IR class. Mm -hmm. So just one semester. But to tell you all that teaching is very important, that is the first job I got after leaving the university teaching. Mm -hmm. the, I'd written a few things here and there but when I was applying for tenure track positions, this was so hard. Actually, one time I was in a train with uh, Jeff, Jeff Pugh, and Jeff told me, Je I told him I'm not going to apply for tenure track positions now. And he told no, 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 apply, apply. <laughs> and in my head, I was like, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. And because <laughs> I didn't, I, I, and as a first gen PhD, also there are things you don't really know that you get to learn later on. You don't really know what first gen means until like I'm appreciating it now. Oh. But then there's so many things I was ignorant about, but I had no idea. I didn't even know what it meant to be a first generation something. But over time you get to realize there's so many things that, so like the application you was telling me to apply, that is the, the order of the day. Oh. And I was pushing back because I was feeling inadequate. But you see, he knew the system. So looking back, he told me. And then um, the other guy, um, Joe, that I teared for, Joe told me, so I told Joe, and I'm getting a lot of rejections and this is just getting too much. And so Joe told me that he applied for this much, I won't say the number, positions before he got to the position he had. And in mind, I was like, what? And Joe, Joe has a Columbia PhD. And that time I didn't even have a PhD. I was like, what? So, <laughs> so, so he, he encouraged me to apply. So you can see if you want to get it, I don't think there's a magic bullet. I can say you're on the right track. Okay. But I have a tenure track position, but I started applying in fall of 2016. Yeah. So you can see that time. Yeah, so a lot of rejections, a lot of rejections that and the jobs you want to get some of them you never hear from them uh, and jeremiah this is your second one right yes 
Mm-hmm. And that's how I was talking about the issue of adaptability because the first one had almost, it was a teaching position in a global studies department, yes. But whatever I was teaching had almost, not, if not nothing to do with <laughs> what I'd study. So mm-hmm. what helped me probably, and this is my own hypothesis, which would be also um, unfounded, what helped me probably land a tenure track position was the fact that I talked to my chair at my at global studies department mm-hmm. and asked him if I could develop a course, which was not part of my, uh, I was not required to develop a course. So mm-hmm. I developed an environmental security course there. Okay. And so this department that hired me was looking for someone to develop the environmental security mm. stuff. And the reason why I'm saying that is probably part of the reason why I got the position is because I was hired. So mentors play a big role and in, in, in stuff, but I was hired and offered the position before recommendation letters were requested, even mm. their names. Mm. So it's, yeah, it's one of those things that I don't know whether you will know what makes you get hired, but it's a very, very, <laughs> it's a very, very, yeah, I don't think there's a magic bullet to it. So everything I've said is true. And what I'm saying, some of it is also true. So, that, but I think you're on the right track. Okay. Once you're able to just yeah. add for position, sorry, it's, it's a lot of it's a lot of hit and miss and try this and try that. And, yes, you know, do a little bit of this other thing and <laughs> yeah, yeah. We have all we've been down all been down that road and all of your all of your professors here have also been <laughs> through all sorts of different adventures to get to to the jobs that we wound up in. Um, oh, and one last I'm thing, I'm gonna have to go. And but I, I want to say one last thing, Evan, about you. Oh, so oh. I forgot about that. So Evan told me I'm in trouble uh, again. <laughs> yes, yes. Sorry. Let me just say this one before I forget. One time when I was starting out the application process, we were in the seminar room. And Evan told me that he has no doubt I will get something. And at that time I was like, all right. <laughs> so it kind of yeah, he believed in me and it worked out later. Yeah. So thank you. Hey, I meant it. You know, I knew and and you and I, you guys were in the same cohort, weren't you, Abby and, and yes. Jeremiah? I remember yes. that was that was a wonderful semester. Yes. I really enjoyed the 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 conflict theory course with you too. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. I, I think about you all often. Oh, I miss your treats, Eben. <laughs> <laughs> Can yeah, I just have... add a little bit to to okay. what Jeremiah was saying? I posted a book in the chat. I mean, yes, there's uh, no clear cut to it, but this book, I found it really, really helpful, especially if you can read it before you even graduate. It gives advice from the time you're a graduate, I mean, your PhD candidate, what you should be doing, you know, the papers that you need to put in order, CVs, is it uh, um, teaching about at what point do you do what? That book is really, really helpful. And I, I wish I had read it earlier. And uh, I wasn't as smart as Jeremiah, who started looking for a job early. I, I just focused on, on, on finishing my dissertation. Oh. So that, I think, if you're, you're looking to what you should be doing step by step, that book is, is helpful. Oh, okay, thank you. I bookmarked it. Well, I it's getting late. It's getting late. I want to thank.